I uh, initially went to Roseville Public School and I think something, uh, we used to have the uh, Anzac service at the school and uh, we heard the stories of, especially of Gallipoli and uh, the Western Front and I was horrified. I was a person that really, uh, I was, uh, couldn't stand the sight of blood, anything per personal. And I actually fainted when I, at school, when I heard these stories of what went on. When Japan came into the war then, December 1941, we realised it was so much closer home and we were more interested and that is when we started uh, getting called up. There was conscription. You had no option. I remember my very first flight and not many people had flown those days. It was for all of us, I think, it was probably the first time they'd been in an aeroplane at 18 or 19 years of age. Our first operation was to tune in the radio they were going to play them some music to us and we had to record what the, the title of that, that music or song was. And uh, I do remember, it was the Song of India. We went to operational training units, different ones for some of us, and then in due course would get crewed up and go to a squadron. Within nine months, of that course finishing, eight of the 20 had gone to squadrons and been killed. The operational training unit I went to, OTU, was actually called Wing because not any Air Force connection there, but the village of Wing, but were only there for a very short while. Uh, and we were sent to the satellite drone Part, the secondary part of it uh, called Little Horwood. The day we arrived, the I think it was the CO or somebody, senior uh, Air Force officer, got us all together. There were 20 wireless operators, 20 navigators, 20 pilots, 20 bomb homers, 20 air gunners of different countries from Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and naturally a lot from the British Isles. He said, righto, you fellows, you've got four days to form yourselves up into a crew. After about three days, nobody had asked me to be there while I was up. And then I saw a chap over there, that looks like Johnny Trail, who was at Sydney Grammar with me. And I went up to him and I said, you're Johnny Trail, aren't you? He was a pilot, I could tell. And he said, that's right. I said, you were at Sydney Grammar. Yes. I said, I was too. Probably a couple of years behind you. He said, oh, yes, Tony Adams. Yeah, I remember you. You were the opening fast bowler in the third 11, weren't you? Well, that really boosted my ego. I said, have you got a wireless operator? He said, well, he said, I have asked a, an English fellow to be my wireless op. He said, I'd love to have you, but if he says yes, he would. Um, uh, well, I'm afraid I won't have you. He'll, I'll have to take him. I've, I'm obliged to take him as a wireless operator. He came back to me and later and said, yes, that fellow, his English chap, has accepted my invitation. Six months later, they trained together and had some operational flying together as a crew. And they were shot down over northern France and the whole seven were killed. I did end up with a crew. Uh, it's, it's Australian invited me initially just one gunner, and uh, later we got a, uh, a flight engineer. So it was four Australians, three English, and we 
immediately started training together. We were to do a supply drop to the French resistance movement. We, on this occasion, had to fly, fly to southern France at 500 feet altitude over the countryside. The bomb aimer lying on his belly in the, his compartment at the nose of the aircraft with a map and a torch. We only flew on very full moon, near full moon nights. He would map read the way the, and be in close liaison with the navigator with his charts. We would usually go to a, a small town and from there locate that town and then do a, a timed running in a certain direction and could find a clearing in the forest where the Frenchmen and perhaps French women would be, they would light flares and we would do a sort of bombing run, dropping these containers which would float down on, on parachutes. We would see the Frenchmen come out from under the trees with you know, horses and carts, pick up the containers, go back under the forest of trees and then we would zoom home up to back to England, up the Loire Valley, in bright moonlight night, over the chateaus, most spectacular, at low altitude, French people would come out and flash V for victory, da -da -da -da, on their torches at, at us as we flew over. It was absolutely exciting. <laughs> I wasn't very fearful at all. And I know some, uh, quite a few, had got shot down by anti-aircraft, not by not by fighters, because we were flying at such low altitude, to be under the the uh, range of radar. This was some time later, flying out of Methwold, on one of these, again to southern France. We'd gone. Uh, no, probably not a short while, maybe an hour, maybe by that time be over the coast of France. And uh, my radio went dead. In those days, the, ro the radios were valves, pre-transistors and all that, pre-everything else. I fiddled around for five minutes and ten minutes and I couldn't get it going, push it in, pull it out, you know. No. And then... Suddenly it came on, and I suddenly this my call sign came through, and a message which I took down the Morse code returned to base at five hundred feet altitude you your uh, reception is perhaps not that good I thought uh, while this operated a pilot, I've just received a message. My radio is working, just received a message, returned to base. Oh, he said, what, the whole bad weather, whole lot going back? No, just, just me, just us. He said, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Okay, Tony, we'll go back, but if you're wrong, you're in real trouble. We went, we returned to England, returned to Methwold, Norfolk. There was a British major who we knew, who had sort of coordinated these, these sort of operations. He came out to our aircraft in the middle of the night. What's up, Major? You've, you recalled us. That's right, he said. I did. And I remember his words to this very day. After you took off, we received word from the other side that the Frenchman at your drop zone had been captured and they had installed two Elekin guns and one Bofors gun. 
awaiting your arrival. We converted from uh, over to the Lancaster bomber, a whole squadron did, and the very first <clears throat> raid that we did on Lancaster was the raid on Duisburg in October 1944. Of course at night you didn't, weren't in formation, even on our day, daylight operations we didn't go on formation, each crew went itself and given a time to be over the, at the target. And we were scheduled to be fairly early in the whole raid of about 1,000 aircraft that night, most, mainly Lancasters. On this occasion, our bomb aimer is there giving instruction to the pilot. Steady, steady, left, left, steady, steady, right, right. Bomb's gone. When that happens, usually the aircraft rises. I don't know how many hundreds of feet. This occasion, it didn't rise. He said an expletive, they haven't gone. Bomb aimer to navigator, did you turn the master switch on? Navigator to bomb aimer, what master switch? He didn't, hadn't been informed of a, that he had, there was a switch there in his compartment that had to be turned on. Anyway, what does the pilot then decide, the pilot and captain? He, did he say, bomb aimer, all right, we'll bomb them now. L release the bombs now. No. He decided that we should do it properly, so we did a big circuit around and with hundreds and hundreds of aircraft in the night, all blacked out, coming towards us, we did a big circle, circle around and came in and eventually bombed them. I had been sent down at the back to make sure the two million candle power flash that was used by, was released by every aircraft to light up the whole target area I had to make sure that it didn't get still stuck in the plane and I would have to manually push it down the chute. Because I was there for 20 minutes or more, I, instead of five, five minutes or so, my hands were frozen. I had to unplug the main from my, my uh, from the main oxygen supply into a, oxygen bottle so I could toddle up to the, my position at the front of the aircraft and my hands were that frozen that I couldn't get it into the, into the bottle after releasing it so I thought heck I'll just have to go up there we're at 21,000 feet uh, toddle up there and I'll be right except we got combed by a searchlight and the, the pilot threw it around a bit and I got thrown around a bit in the end, I crawled up. I had to crawl over the main spar, which was the, the spar connecting the, each wing. And the navigator saw us had been in trouble and he plugged in my oxygen for me to the main supply. When we're getting near a target like that, or really mostly when I'm not on the, on the radio, wireless operators st stand in the nearby position under what is called the astrodome. It's put there, it's a persplex dome on the top of the fuselage where I can get a good view of everything going on. And I'm an extra pair of eyes, night and day. So I'm standing up there and we're getting towards the target and I see anti-aircraft shells exploding in front of me, maybe a mile or two. It's a whole black puffs coming all, all the time. And we think, how the heck are we going to get through that? And you do, you just hopefully go straight 
keep flying straight ahead. It's, it's, it's the pilot's decision. Well, he, he has got no, he's got no option either. But on one occasion, the noise of the anti-aircraft shells was so loud, I thought, we're going to be hit at any moment. To save precious seconds, I put my, my uh, parachute onto the harness, ready to make a quick exit if, if the pilot and captain should order bail out. We did, on occasions, get hit. You'd, after you landed, you inspect the aircraft and see jagged holes over it. We didn't get a tremendous number, but, uh, but, but carrying on, what I'm looking for, a friend, there's that Lancaster, maybe half a mile ahead. I'm, I can see it ahead. There's one on, on, on a daylight raid. There's a Lancaster flying virtually in formation beside us. I'm looking at it and suddenly it got a burst. Apparently it must have blown up its bomb load. It was there one moment and it's a huge, just black cloud. Towards the end of the war flying the Lancasters, our navigator had to operate a refined navigational equipment called GH. Not all aircraft had it. Not all aircraft in our group had it. But 149 Squadron did, all the aircraft 149. And to signify that, on the tail they had, I think it was, yeah, stripes were, were on the tail fins. Other aircraft seeing us with these stripes and knowing that that would enable them to more accurately bomb, they would formate on us. When they saw our bomb doors open, they'd open their bomb doors. When they saw our bombs released, they'd release theirs too. And um, on this one particular occasion, an aircraft on their starboard is flying alongside us, perhaps 100, 100 metres away, fairly close, fairly close. And I, suddenly I saw his wing catch fire. Uh, the a shell had burst, an anti-aircraft shell had burst under the wing and it immediately caught the, the fuel tanks there on fire, flames in a fraction of a second. In a second. I couldn't believe it. The flames had spread and the tailplane was alight. Flames were streaming back and it spiralled away. It has been suggested because it was spiralling, there was a centrifugal force that, that prevented the crew from, from getting out. And I've, I know now, I thought it was originally a, a, from the, a New Zealand squadron, but it wasn't. It was a, another RAF squadron not far from us. And uh, the crew, I think, were all Englishmen. Uh, they all died. They crashed and, and died. You wrote letters home, of course, and occasionally you'd have to tell folks at home, your parents, sorry to tell you that Cole Terrace, who was in my in scouts at Roseville with me, uh, as I've heard he's he's been killed in operations, uh, or 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 he's or he's gone missing. I said, there's a very good chance that he'll be escaping. Of course, you knew it wasn't. A, you were trying to play it, that down all the time to your parents, but they weren't probably fooled at all anyway. Anyway, on this, this last one was a, a, a town called Mersburg, M-E-R-S-E-B-U-R-G, near Leipzig. It was our longest bombing trip. and. Uh, unfortunately, our navigator took ill and was, had to go to hospital that morning. And we had to have a, a somebody, we got another navigator to join us. 
we anyway we uh, we got through and got back and as I got off the aircraft I got down on my hands and knees and kissed the the, the tarmac at Methwold. From then on was uh, just went to um, a fair bit of leave, went to a station right up the very top of uh, Scotland called Nairn, a non-flying station where I had intelligence uh, tests and things to see, trying to determine what we're going to do with Tony Adams for the rest of the war. And uh, there were various things thrown up, but in the end it was decided some months later uh, that um, would be sent back to Australia. The war was uh, getting towards a conclusion in, in Germany. When we came back from the, from, the, from the war, from those who were in Bomber Command, there wasn't a great fuss about us and we didn't want to fuss. Anzac Day is the one day in the year when I really remember the great loss of a, a large number of friends, young friends, who uh, some I was at school with, some I, was, I trained with, and several on the, who were on my squadron, and I remember them. And when I hear the ode, or even have, I've been requested recently on several occasions to recite the ode. Uh, they shall not grow old, as we who are left grow old, means a lot to me.